Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. And we are in the season of Lent, spring season. There are four seasons, as we all know, spring, summer, autumn, winter. In the Western countries, instead of autumn, they call fall season. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. Fall season is a beautiful season. Every season is a beautiful season. Every season arrives in God's perfect timing. And you know, the Western countries, they enjoy every season. In, here in India, we have only three seasons. You all know very well. Hot, hotter, hottest. Though it's, a, it's spring season, summer has already started. We are all sweating. There in the fall season, they have to set the clock one hour behind. And in spring, they have to set the clock one hour before. So they call it daylight saving in spring. Daylight saving. It's difficult for people to get up early in the morning. They'll think they got up at 6 o'clock, but it will be 7 o'clock in the morning during spring. This month, they are going to start the daylight saving. So there's a beautiful phrase. I shared it with you during my tenure here. The, to remember the timings. They say spring ahead, one hour before. And fall, they go back. They say fall back. Fall back and spring ahead. So that's the phrase they use all over the U.S. Lenten season comes at the time of spring. Spring season gives us a good lesson, and Lenten season gives us a good opportunity to come closer to the cross, to know about, more about God's love and sacrifice, and to come closer to the cross, to know more about His love and salvation. There are certain things that we have to do. First of all, purge any old attitudes and allow yourself the freedom to move into a new season. Lenten season gives us an opportunity to purge our old attitudes. And we have to ask Jesus to scrub our heart clean again as we request forgiveness, not only forgiving others, but embracing forgiveness for ourselves. This is called spring cleaning our soul. Spring cleaning our soul. The third one, clean out the cobwebs of negative thoughts. We have to discard all negative thought patterns and latch on to spiritual truths. We have to experience a vivacious, positive thought. No negative thought patterns. And the fourth one, take inventory of your spiritual routines and spruce them up as needed. Restore stale relationships by connecting and sharing love again. Let us spend a little quiet time with God. What better time we can have to refresh our soul than during Lenten season. Let us invite Jesus to show us what we might need to clean up in order to grow deeper in our faith and closer to the Lord. So, spring has arrived. Goodbye winter, welcome spring. So let us ask God to completely transform us so that we can live, live out His will for our life and shine His light for others to see. Now, the topic given to us for this Sunday 
is true worship that liberates. Last Sunday, last year, I preached on the same topic. Topic, they changed the topic, but the subject is the same. Liberating Christ was the topic, but same passage, same passage. But today, they have changed a little bit. True worship that liberates. Exodus chapter 3, and then Psalm, and only epistle they have changed from Galatians to Acts. Gospel lesson is the same. But every time we look at the word of God, we receive new insights. Though they look old, though they are repeated, but they give us new insights and new thoughts so that we can do new things and great things for God's glory. Here, Jesus liberates a woman from a disability in synagogue on a Sabbath. Let us turn to St. Luke chapter 13, verses from 10 to 17. Synagogue and worship. On this particular Sabbath, there was a special excitement at the synagogue. When this woman, crippled woman, where this crippled woman regularly went to worship, to this particular synagogue. Synagogues were the heart of Jewish religious life. When you read the Gospels, all the four Gospels, you will see synagogues everywhere, towns, cities, villages. And when Jesus traveled along, he worshipped at synagogue on Sabbath day. He took his disciples and crowd also followed him. And he performed miracles. He preached there. He taught there. And he performed miracles there. So here synagogues were the heart of Jewish religious life. Here a Galilean preacher and prophet, Jesus of Nazareth, had arrived in town and would be preaching there. So there was so much of excitement. This woman was a regular worshipper. As usual, she went to the synagogue. Now, what happens? Jesus preaches and liberates. Jesus preaches and liberates. When you look at John chapter 4, verse 16, it says, it's Jesus' custom to attend worship in the synagogue and is often invited to preach. It was his custom to go to the synagogue on Sabbath days. Whether he was in town or in village or city, he never missed his Sabbath day worship. He never missed synagogue. So he has set an example before all of us. Only during pandemic and lockdown, we were not able to come to the church. We sang the beautiful hymn, We love this place, O God. We love this sanctuary. We love to worship in your sanctuary. We love to praise you in your sanctuary. We love to thank you in your sanctuary. We love to have fellowship with you and fellowship with one another. We love to adore you. We love to worship you. We love to bow down before you. And that's why we come to the church. The psalm says in Psalm 100, we know very well. That's a beautiful psalm. It is also used for responsive reading. Psalm 100 verse 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Worship the Lord with gladness. We are here to worship the Lord. And Jesus has set an example. So he preaches and liberates. What happens? Jesus began to teach. His words turned from teaching to invitation. He started preaching. At the time he saw this crippled woman. Then he stopped preaching. His preaching is turned 
into invitation. He called her immediately, come here. And she slowly made her way to the front of the assembly, to the congregation. And then he said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. You are set free from your disability. When he spoke those words, he put his hands gently on her back, on her broken, crippled body, bent body. She felt power surge through her. It never happened before. She has been suffering for 18 long years. For the first time in her life, she could feel some power surging through her. You know what happened? Without hesitation, she straightened her once crooked back or crippled body or crooked body. She stood tall and praised God. From teaching to invitation. Then what happened? The liberated woman praises and the crowd rejoices. She stood tall and praised God. And here, after that, Jesus says, he gives a new name to her. There is no name mentioned here. Jesus calls her a daughter of Abraham. Daughter of Abraham. That's the title Jesus gives to this crippled woman. When she received God's power, she became all right. She became a new person. She became a normal person. And she started praising God. Here Jesus gives her a new name, daughter of Abraham. Jesus' perspective on the Sabbath day, Sabbath as day for deliverance is vindicated. Here what happens when she was cured, the authorities, the priests and high priests were so upset. Why do you come on a Sabbath day to be healed? You have got six days to heal. And Jesus replies to them, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water. And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, you don't recognize her as the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day. When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. So Jesus' perspective on the Sabbath as day for deliverance is vindicated here. Luke narrates the humiliation of Jesus' opponents and the joy of the crowd and his, at his wonderful deeds. The praise the woman offers to God reverberates with the crowd's rejoicing. When one person started praising God, the whole crowd start, started joining her in praising God. That's what we do in the church. When we announce the song number, when the pastor or the leader or the conductor announces the song number, when the organ is played, the music is played, when the choir starts leading, the whole congregation joins. All of us join to praise God because He has done so much for us. He has brought us here to worship Him. He has brought us here to worship Him. And He has blessed us. And we are here as His witnesses. Both themes of praise and rejoicing are emphasized by Luke as appropriate responses to God's work of liberation. Why do we praise God? Because God has liberated us. God has saved us from the bondage of sin. 
God has redeemed us, rescued us. We are free people, liberated. And that's what we see here. Jesus, the liberator, the fourth point. Jesus, the liberator. Jesus is the liberator, enabling us to stand straight, freeing us from what bows our heads. This woman was looking at the earth. She was not able to look up at the sky. Bent over for 18 long years. And this topic is so relevant today, though it is repeated again this year. Two days ago, we celebrated International Women's Day. Day before yesterday, March 8th, all over the world. International Women's Day. So it's so appropriate. Women are bent over. Women are oppressed in the Indian society. The missionaries have uplifted the women. They worked for the emancipation of women. And the church is doing that today. All are equal in the sight of God. In Christ, there is no man or woman. There is no Jew or Greek. All are equal in the sight of God. And that's what Christianity says. And that many people in India don't like it. Women are emancipated, uplifted. They were bent over. They were seeing only the earth, not the sky. Jesus has liberated both men and women. The whole world and people are not willing to accept that. It is freeing her from the spirit that had crippled her. It is not a kind of disease or ailment. Jesus clearly says, when Satan bound her for 18 long years, this passage doesn't speak about disease or ailment, a disability bound by Satan. Healing and freeing. But Jesus heals and frees. Healing and freeing. Her condition was formed by a demonic spirit of bondage that had left her unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over. Let's look at it again. And said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. The bent over woman fixed her mind and her total hope in the Lord. She did not ask for healing. She didn't ask Jesus to heal her. She was simply taking part in the worship service. The same way we may not ask Jesus to heal us. We have simply come to worship him. We have simply come to meet him. We have simply come to praise Him. We have simply come to give our offering to Him. But remember, Jesus looks at all of us. He sees us and He wants to touch us. He called that woman over and He said, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And He gently touches her. And she was made all right. So, you see before picture and after picture. Before picture, she was a bent over woman, a crippled woman, a, who had a crooked back. That is before picture. After picture, she is standing tall, totally different. The same person looks different she stands tall before others. Jesus sees and touches her, and the picture of life changes. When God looks at us, when God touches us, our total life will change. We'll stand erect before the world. We need not bend over. We can stand erect and face any problem and any person, any situation, because I am touched by Jesus. 
when you and I are touched by Jesus, we can stand erect. Our ailment will go. A demonic spirit will go and will be free from all ailments and illness. Who has seen and touched your life in a way that let you stand a bit taller? More of yourself or be more fully engaged in life? That question we have to ask. Who has seen me and who has touched me? That is before picture and after picture. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of body. God has set us free. God has redeemed us in Jesus Christ. We should not go back to our old way of life. That's what Apostle Paul says. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's what happened in Egypt. The first lesson says that. Exodus chapter 3, verses from 11 to 18. God appears before Moses in a burning bush. What is the spiritual meaning of the burning bush? I'm not going into the details of this story. The burning bush represents God's intention to destroy sin and dispense grace. That is the spiritual meaning of the burning bush. One of the early church fathers, Chrysostom, he lived between 347 and 407 CE, says the bush represents the resurrection of the Jews, and as the bush burned without being consumed, so also Jesus died, but death did not overcome him. I repeat, Chrysostom says that the bush represents the resurrection of the Jews, and as the bush burned without being consumed, so also Jesus died, but death did not overcome him. And here God calls Moses to lead Israel out of slavery. He makes so many excuses. But God said, you are the person. You are the right person to lead the people of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. So God tells Moses to spearhead the liberation of Israel from Egyptian slavery. And God wants you and me to spearhead the liberation of the people. The people who do not know the value of life, the people who live in sin, the people who do not know the real Savior, the true Savior, who came in great humility to die and suffer on the cross for the sins of the whole world. It is your duty and my duty to take this message of liberation to the world. And God wants you and me to spearhead this moment of liberation. True worship liberates. True worship liberates. And that's what we see in Isaiah chapter 6. Let us turn to Isaiah chapter 6. We know this incident very well. And based on this chapter, the beautiful hymn was composed, Holy, 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 Lord God of Almighty, Lord God Almighty. Isaiah 6, chapter 6 is known by biblical scholars as theophany. Theophany means appearance of God, appearance of God. God appeared before Isaiah when he went to worship him in his sanctuary. He never expected that he would be able to see God. God appeared before him. He could see the majesty and the holiness of God. Then he immediately said, Woe unto me, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. 
and I live among a people of unclean lips. Woe unto me. Isaiah, in the, in the presence of God, is confronted with not only who God is, but with who he is in relation to God. That is the meaning of worship. We come here to know who God is, to understand who God is, to discover who God is. At the same time, we also discover our own self in relation to God. Who am I? Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Can we say that? Oh, unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips. The scene defines for us what being in God's presence might entail and it may be an example to us of what worship should be in our lives. This passage, this meeting, we should apply in our life whenever we come to worship Him. This passage reveals three elements of what true worship is. First of all, worship is wonderment. Worship is wonderment. Isaiah enters the presence of God, is awestruck by God's majesty and holiness. Could see cherub, cherubim and seraphim. They say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He was awestruck. The same experience we must have every time we come to worship God. We must, like Isaiah, we must have the same kind of experience. Isaiah was awestruck by God's majesty and holiness. Second one, worship is transformative. And Isaiah was cleansed and forgiven by God. In God's presence, Isaiah sees who he really is, a sinner. I'm a man of unclean, I'm lost. Save me, redeem me. Yet in his confession of his sinfulness, Isaiah is transformed into the person God desires him to be. And that's why we are here. When we come to worship God, God transforms us according to his will. According to his desire. So that we can become new creatures and take the message of love and salvation into the world. Third one, worship is renewing. Through God's forgiveness, Isaiah is a renewed person who lives for the people, who lives for the purpose and will of God. So after transformation, what should we do? We should live for the purpose and the will of God. So he calls out to God, God says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here I am. Send me, O Lord. Here I am. He comes forward and he became the greatest prophet. He is the number one major prophet. There are three major prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. He is the eighth century prophet. He is the one who prophesied about the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The whole thing is there. The whole narrative is there. And Jesus often used the book of Isaiah in the synagogue. Here I am, send me. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. Finally, remember, worship is wonderment. Worship is transformative and worship is renewing. Lexham Theological Workbook's brief definition of worship goes like this. Let me read. Worship is the odd response to the saving acts and praiseworthy character of God. Let me repeat. Worship 
is the awed or revered response to the saving acts and praiseworthy character of God. In the beginning, when we started the prayers, the first order says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That's what we find in John chapter 4, verse 24. Jesus had a dialogue with the Samaritan woman. Then she realized that she was talking to the Messiah. So she went to the town and brought everybody. I have found the Messiah. I have seen the Messiah. Come and see the Messiah here. And to her, Jesus said, and before that she said, we worship God in Jerusalem, in Zion. And Jesus said, the time will come. You can pray anywhere in the world, not only at Jerusalem. And that's what we are doing today. Worship is held all over the world in different places at different timings. But we all worship. We become one in the Lord and one in the Spirit. The whole world is worshiping Jesus on Sunday, the first day of the week, the day of resurrection. True believers or humble worshipers. So church is the liberating agent of God. God sent many, many prophets in the beginning, many judges, many kings to fulfill his plan and purpose. And finally he sent his only begotten son. And then Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And the Trinity sent the church into the world. We are sent by God into the world. And we have to liberate people. Church has to liberate people from all kinds of bondages. So through worship, we can bring about liberation. We are liberated to liberate. Remember, worship is not praising or singing or reading the lesson. Worship should be our lifestyle. That should be the way of our life. Of course, we have to come to the sanctuary to worship as one family. But worship should become our lifestyle. Worship should be a way of life. And that's what God wants us to do. It's wonderment, it's transformative, and it is renewing. May God bless all of us. Amen.